thank you very much and greetings to everyone from uh from new york city uh thank you for uh joining us today my name is is david ibsen i'm the executive director of the counter extremism uh, project, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this discussion, uh, organized by CEP and our partners, Globesec, uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood presence and activities in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. This is the second in a series of reports and related webinars uh, on this topic. The first report uh, consisted of a broader survey conducted by our colleagues at Globesec uh, of the CEE region as a whole and the Muslim Brotherhood presence and activities there. Uh, while this uh, second report um, uh, focuses more on three specific countries from uh, the region, namely uh, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, and Serbia. We are very uh, fortunate uh, to have a knowledgeable uh, and distinguished uh, group of, uh, of participants today to present and discuss on this subject. But just with your indulgence, I would like to make a, a brief uh, word about the Counter Extremism Project before we move into, uh, into introductions. Um, CEP is a transatlantic research and advocacy organization. Uh, we focus on disrupting the activities of extremists and terrorist groups across the spectrum. So from uh, the extreme right wing on one hand to Islamist uh, terrorist groups and terrorism uh, actors uh, on the other. Uh, CEP has a particular expertise that we've developed in a few areas. Uh, one is on online extremism. And by that I mean uh, how extremists leverage and misuse uh, internet uh, service platforms uh, and social media platforms to incite, recruit, um, propagandize. Uh, in addition, we also focus on uh, financial networks in addition to communication networks. And by that, I mean um, uh, tracking and examining how uh, extremists and terrorists uh, raise funds, how they transfer those funds, how they store those funds. And of course, we try and develop strategies and tactics to pressure and disrupt uh, those types of activities. Uh, CEP also works, of course, in the PVE and CVE space, mainly with a focus on uh, reintegration, rehabilitation of uh, convicted terrorist uh, actors, uh, both in the US and Europe. Um, our research and analysis on all of those foregoing topics, of course, is available on our website at counterextremism.com, uh, in addition to a number of different databases and resources that we maintain on extremist groups and leaders uh, and ideologies. And I encourage you all to avail yourselves uh, of those resources. Um, CEP, in addition to our headquarters here in, in New York, we also maintain a presence in Europe. We have offices uh, in Berlin, offices in Brussels. Uh, the office in Berlin is led by Dr. Hans Schindler uh, with support from Marco McCory. And I'd like to thank them both specifically for helping to facilitate and organize uh, this, this event uh, today. And then of course also uh, big thanks uh, uh, and appreciation to our great partners at Globesec, in particular Victor, uh, for helping to bring this uh, report, the second report in a series uh, to fruition and this webinar today. Globesec has always been a tremendous partner for CEP. CEP has previously support, supported Globesec work um, most uh, recently before this report uh, on a study on the pathways to radicalization of foreign terrorist fighters. That report was completed in 2019. I encourage you all to, to check that out uh, as well. So thank you uh, again. Welcome. Looking forward to this discussion. Um, and um, it's my pleasure to hand it back to my good friend, Hans, uh, for the introductions of our first presenter. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this, David. And, and thanks, of course, uh, for getting up um, brutally early to be in the office at 8 a.m. in New York. I really appreciate it. I now have the great pleasure and honor um, to introduce Martin Klus, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs um, at um, uh, of the Slovak Republic. Martin Klus is a Slovak professional political scientist and graduated political theorist. He has obtained a postgraduate diploma in theory and politics. Prior to entering Slovak politics, he had worked as a university lecturer and political analyst, providing political analyses and commentaries to domestic and foreign media. Between the years 2013 and 14, he has ranked among the most cited uh, Slovak political scientists and sociologists. Since 1999, he has been actively engaged in the non-profit sector with the aim to empower civic and student participation in public affairs, but also in education and urban environment improving activities. He often partakes in political and civic initiatives on the topic of electoral and referendum legislation. Martin Klus has entered communal politics in Banska Bristica in 2014. From 2016 to 2020, he was a member of the National Council of the Slovak Republic and Deputy Speaker during the last six months of his tenure. 
as of March 2020, has now become the State Secretary for EU Affairs at the Slovak Ministry of Foreign Affairs, both the GAC Minister and the Sherpa. Besides that, he is, his agenda includes disinformation hybrid threats, human rights in crisis management, which very much explains why he would be, would be giving the opening remarks on a CEP Globsec uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Mr. State Secretary. I'm very, very honored to have you here. And uh, please, the screen is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Schindler, uh, dear colleagues uh, from academia and NGOs, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would like to kindly thank uh, Counterterrorism Extreme, Counter Extremism Project and, uh, of course, Blobsec for organizing this uh, webinar, uh, as well as for the opportunity to take part in it, uh, especially when it comes to such an important and uh, lately, uh, due to COVID-19 crisis, less frequently discussed issue. Ladies and gentlemen, extremism and terrorism are not linked uh, to any nation, ethnicity or religion. Uh, this is a statement appreciated uh, whatsoever uh, in all multilateral preambles. Yet uh, religious, uh, religion-based extremism is a harsh reality which we can observe through acts of individuals and groups uh, misusing mostly Islam and also anti-Islam as a justification for the cause. The fight against radical Islamists has not uh, only been taking place on traditional battlefields such as uh, the defeat of the Daesh, uh, Caliphate in Iraq or Syria, or uh, the ongoing intervention in Sahel. Uh, often the radicals and extremists utilize tools of hybrid warfare, and we have to devise defenses uh, in order to deal with a blurry, even sublime efforts of targeted radical conscription on propaganda. Paradoxically, uh, the fight against radicalism and extremism is also becoming more complex due to factors we generally comprehend as a beneficial to mankind. In particular, technologies, progress and communications, including social media platforms and modern means of travel that erase limitation in distances. Taking this into account, it becomes clear that no one can feel safe or excluded from this threat. This also applies to our countries in Central Europe equally. Despite the fact that in recent Europe, we have mostly seen extremism based on far right and nationalist ideas, we must not forget the threat stemming from the religious motivation. The ongoing pandemic crisis has led to a certain decrease in extremist acts, but this by no means suggests that the threat no longer exists. Quite uh, the contrary. Conscription and propaganda to wake up uh, and activate lone wolves uh, uh, that uh, continues. For example, Daesh still has uh, substantial resources and sophisticated recruiting methods. This has also been reflected in the creation of Global Counter Daesh Coalition uh, communication cell in London. Moreover, legacy of extremist uh, text, albeit officially sanctioned, is still targeting moderate Islamic communities in Europe. In order to address the situation, the European Union has been looking into ways how to engage in dialogue with Saudi Arabia on this issue. Nowadays, uh, with COVID-19, one cannot afford to dismiss other numerous, uh, numerous specific the pandemic uh, has uh, posed for countering extremism, like obligatory quarantine that could have psychological effects on radicals and extremists. It could possibly make uh, them feel irrelevant and thus, consequently, pressing them to remind us of their existence by executing violent acts. All mentioned aspects hinder our, hinder our effort to protect our societies against extremism and terrorism, including the Islamist variants. That's why it is very important to focus on conclusion from this year, uh, UN Virtual Counterterrorism Week that uh, took place in early July this year, not to relax in our fight against extremism and terrorism. So in order to summarize and draw conclusions, we have to ask ourselves, where are the main areas we should focus on in our fight against extremism and terrorism? First, countering extremism messaging and propaganda in effective and systematic way. Second, working with youth and community, including religious ones, to foster their resilience against extremism. Third, addressing the issue of foreign terrorist fighters due to process 
uh, and uh, deliberate on the different views on their relocation to find a solution. Fourth, addressing the issue of their closest relatives in terms of their future, particularly the children and wives in order to protect and avert uh, them from extremist footsteps. Fifth, issues regarding serving the sentence, uh, radicalization, prevention in, pri in prisons, and reintegration into society. Sixth, border control and effect effective management of illegal migration while protecting humanitarian, humanitarian corridor and refugees. And uh, last but not least, seventh, human rights and their protection. If we break them in order to fight terrorism, we can create a vicious circle. So this is uh, so far everything from me and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, you will enjoy this webinar and uh, it was my pleasure to take the uh, first part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, State Secretary. Uh, Your Excellency, it's really an honor to have you with us today and, and thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to do this. I really appreciate this. Before we now come to the two presentations on the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in those three particular countries, I just would like to remind everyone again that there is a Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. So please, if you have any questions, um, post them there at any time during those presentations. Uh, there will be a small five minute uh, Q&A segment after the first presentation, just to make sure that everyone who has a detailed question because the, the sound was not good or there is something that wasn't clear enough to be addressed then and then a second presentation and then we have a long Q&A session to discuss the various issues in depth. Um, I would now like to introduce my colleague and, and by now very good friend, we've been cooperating for a couple of years now, Victor Seuss. Victor Seuss is a program manager and research fellow with the National Security Program at Klopsek Policy Institute. He focuses on challenges related to the changing European security environment. Victor, uh, Victor projects study Muslim Brotherhood in, the, in CCE, jihadi terrorism trends in Europe or countering terrorist financing. Therefore, Victor, you will now present the basic findings from the study you just concluded in cooperation with us. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Victor, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Hans, for the introduction. Uh, thank, obviously, thank to SEP, the CEP for, uh, for helping us with the project and giving us the opportunity to conduct this research in the first place. Obviously, it's a great honor to have um, Mr. Secretary Kluse opening our event um, again with Klopsek. We really value your, uh, our, our partnership and our, our cooperation. And also thank you so much, the, um, Professor Mincheva, for uh, taking the opportunity to be the discussant in, um, upon my presentation. So let me start my presentation and share my screen. A second. Oh, just a technical. Thank you for having the patience. And uh, is this working? Almost. Here we go. No, it was better before we picked up. It was better before, okay. Then, sorry, this two screen thing Perfect is now. still uh, still Sarah than you. So, um, obviously, before I start the presentation, I would like to um, I would like to thank the research team who has been collecting the information and writing the report with us. Um, that means Katsko Rekovic, the external uh, fellow of Klopsek, and Andra Markinovic, Marinkovic, sorry, uh, junior uh, junior researcher also at Klopsek. Um, and as well as uh, as all of the audience that has uh, has turned up for this uh, for this presentation, um, before I s jump into the findings, I would like to briefly show um, or discuss a little bit the methodology and and talk about how I how we have came to the findings that uh, that I'll present in the later in the later slides. So the general methodology focuses on on five countries. The Czech Republic, Poland, Serbia, North Macedonia, and Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, to see the Muslim Brotherhood operate in different environments. Um, we have focused on, pardon, sorry, we have focused on three of these countries: uh, Czech Republic, Poland, and Serbia. But um, we have been thinking, how do we, how do we map the Muslim Brotherhood presence in such countries? Um, what communities do we look into? 
So we know we need to be looking into, uh, we know there's indigenous communities in all of these, in almost all of these countries, except the Czech Republic. And these are the autochthonous communities uh, that are, that are present, that have been present there for centuries in these countries and have, uh, and have uh, been, uh, and have been practicing a strand of Islam that has, that has uh, not been very, I would say, uh, not been very interesting for the Islamists. Um, so in that matter, we need to be looking at the other communities as well existing in these countries, which is the expatriates and converts communities. Um, Czech Republic only has these communities. Poland has a sizable community that is, uh, that is, uh, that is actually larger than the indigenous Tatar community. Uh, Serbia has around 200,000 of these, of these expatriates uh, and converts concentrated around Belgrade. However, uh, there is another community, the autochthonous community that is uh, quite large and these two are in opposition. North Macedonia doesn't have an expatriate or large expatriate and converts community. But we know from our previous research that uh, it has had issues uh, with, may, I would say, keeping radical imams out of their mosques. Uh, hence, there is uh, an opportunity there, but we need to take a different approach in uh, mapping this country. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country that has, uh, obviously, that has a large indigenous community and has a, a, a large one. And this is, this is a case study in our in our research, because um, here we need to take a very different approach. And the reason why is because there's another lens that we want to uh, look at while we're mapping these five countries. And that is the representation of these communities vis-a-vis -vis the state. So in the case of Czech Republic and Poland, we don't have any national Muslim religious organizations. Uh, these are, um, there are obviously Muslim religious organizations registered at different levels but um, none of them are declared or understood by the government as national, as representing the official formal Islam of, uh, of that particular country. This is different to Serbia, where there is a national Muslim religious organization, but as I previously mentioned, it is in competition with, uh, with, uh, with the other one that is uh, based in Belgrade. The difference is uh, one is uh, the autochthonous uh, the autochthonous Islamic organization is based in Sanjak or in uh, on in Rashka region, and is most and is quite influenced by the Bosnian uh, unitary Muslim religious organization. While the one in Serbia mostly represents expatriates and converts, so we have two different uh, organizations also representing two different uh, communities. And last but not least, North Macedonia and Bo uh, Bosnia Herzegovina both have unitary Muslim religious organizations. However, North Macedonia has, uh, uh, the, I would say the status of this organization is, uh, um, is rather a tricky one within the country given the, uh, the position that the government puts it in as well as uh, the Orthodox Church. Um, there, uh, I, could, I could say there's a contentious, in, uh, contentious uh, atmosphere in there. Um, so let me move on to the labeling of the study organizations because we expect to find different organizations uh, in this research and we have created three different labels to represent this. The first label is the Muslim Brotherhood Affiliated Groups. This is a label that um, sort of groups together organizations that, um, that have, should have official links or should have official membership in Muslim Brotherhood uh, federative pan-European bodies, such as the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, for instance. Um, and this is a, here the methodology should be quite clear. Uh, if an, a given organization has this membership, um, the, we, we would flag it as a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated group. That's what the label stands for. However, during our research, we have found that this uh, label needs a little bit of nuance uh, because um, some of these organizations have been members for a very long time, although have not been very active throughout their time. And I'll explain this a little bit more in detail in later slides once I show it on the on the three case studies in the in the report. The second label um, that we use is called Muslim Brotherhood Inspired Groups. 
and this uh, organism or this label um, is a little bit more um, it's a little bit more nuanced in the in its methodology because it's not uh, we don't use this black and white sort of uh, thinking whether as we do in in the first in the first label but we look at the various range of activities uh, that the studied organizations would conduct so we have been tracking these activities and looking at them uh, from all over the, um, I would say, in all, all, all sort of sources. So we have been looking at links through personal ties of leaders of these organizations with Muslim Brotherhood representatives or people who have been uh, accused in li literature, at least, of being Muslim Brotherhood affiliated. We've been looking a little bit at funding and, and the ideological support, etc. The last group, or the last label, uh, we call the gray area groups. And here we use the same methodology as in the first or in the second label, uh, so again, we look at the activities. Um, however, this label exists for the purpose of having groups that where we don't have conclusive findings, when we cannot for sure say that these uh, organizations have been, um, have been Muslim Brotherhood inspired or linked to. Simply either the data is insufficient or there is uh, a lot of conflicting information uh, that we just cannot say with certainty. Uh, that this is uh, this is the Muslim Brotherhood labeled organization. So, um, how do we determine the connections? Muslim Brotherhood is known for uh, conducting a variety of activities, um, facilitating education, medical services, uh, or charities or conferences are some of the first things that come to mind. But um, there can be a lot more of these activities, and uh, there can be quite overwhelming at some time. So. We need a system to organize such uh, such uh, such uh, mapping, I would say, and we chose four levels. Uh, there is the obvious religious level, uh, followed by social level, which is aimed more at communities or at, at events and ac activities that are go beyond the Muslim community. They go to the wider society and non-Muslims as well. Um, there is a very important political level, which, as we identify in our methodology, to be one of the most important key things uh, in, um, in, uh, in a Muslim Brotherhood-inspired organization, since we believe the idea there is to, have su uh, to be successful in representing the Muslim uh, community or minority, depending on the country, um, in order to uh, gain an advantageous position in, in negotiation with the government. To, to get uh, perhaps more rights for that community to be able to build uh, schools that uh, like religious schools or to be uh, able to serve in the army for instance and 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 such uh, uh, such activities and the last one is funding and the funding element uh, works as a supporting element in our research because it is one that is quite uh, elusive to to really determine uh, the sources of funding. It is not always something that is readily available for research, uh, for researchers to find. Uh, some organizations might not, actually might choose not to declare their financing sources and might not have to uh, under certain legislatures. So this is, uh, this is something that we use as a, as a supporting element in our methodology. And indeed we have seen some of these um, some of these activities and some of these connections. So I'll talk about them a little bit uh, more in detail later. So the next, um, so this is the report. This is what uh, we were trying to show the, the case studies of Czech Republic, Poland and Serbia. And let me zoom in, zoom in on these countries a little bit more um, and talk about how we have collected this information. Uh, so we had three researchers and each has covered one country. Um, we've been conducting interviews with four major groups or four general groups. Uh, the first one has been experts from academia. The second has been uh, government representatives. The third were representatives of Islamic uh, communities or Islamic uh, organizations, uh, whether they were in a, whether they were in a competitive relationship with the studied organizations. Uh, or, or other or cooperative and the last one have been uh, a group of um, people who would be critical of the given study organizations people who would be in direct opposition and uh, would not be part of uh, Islamic communities at all 
So besides that, obviously we have also looked at uh, some primary sources, so the official websites of these country, uh, of these uh, organizations, um, social media, their media appearances, etc. Uh, and we have also uh, uh, we have also reviewed secondary literature on the topic as well. So this is how we have collected the data on the three given countries. So before I jump into the uh, the findings. Let me just give you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talk about. talking about. Uh, I'll be explaining the, the ma four major themes we have been writing, writing about in the report and, uh, and explaining the state of the studied organizations today. So the first one is the formal connections. Uh, this obviously will follow the methodology that I explained a little bit earlier. Um, uh, after that, we'll be looking at the activities that these uh, organizations have been doing in the past years. Uh, after that, we'll be looking at the security station, and this is an important element in understanding uh, the state of these organizations currently. Where do they find themselves at the moment uh, and why they behave the way they behave? And um, the last uh, slide will be about the present day situation in, in, in each country. So let me start with the formal connections. And uh, on the right side, you'll always see a, uh, of the screen, you'll see a timeline. And quite conveniently, uh, these four themes follow a timeline, chronological timeline, um, where there will be a little note, a zeitgeist note, you know, sort of depicting the, the, the trend at the time uh, that sort of wraps it up uh, what, the, what the situation have been uh, at that time. So in the 1990s, uh, obviously the regimes the regime have, have, has changed in all three countries, um, from communism to uh, democracy, and this has meant this has opened space for Islam, uh, for Islamic communities to start registering as communities, start organizing more formally, uh, which hasn't been possible under communism uh, due to its secular nature and, and <laughs> repressive uh, tactics, obviously. And you know, what this meant that is that these organizations have been trying to reach out to, to other already existing pan-European organizations. And this is where we talk about, again, uh, the FIOE and FEMISO uh, organizations. Mostly these has been student organizations. As you can say, we have seen two cases, in Czech, one in Czech Republic, one in Poland. In Czech Republic, it has been the General Union of Muslim Students. In Poland, it was the Muslim Students Association. These two um, student organizations have uh, registered with FEMISO at the time and have been uh, slightly active uh, in meeting the, the members of this, of this federation. Um, and one thing I might mention with the Czech uh, case, the General Union of Muslim Students have been established by a, a Sudanese leader, uh, leader of the organization, uh, Mohammed Abbas, who has been later evicted or fired from this organization and has set up his own organization later on in year 2000. And he has called it the Muslim Union, uh, which he has later registered at the FIOE, the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe. And um, I think it's very important to also mention um, the Muslim Union currently doesn't represent a big number of uh, Muslims in the Czech Republic. It's uh, based in Prague. Um, it's rather a small and peripheral community, uh, which from time to time receives some attention, media attention, I would say, uh, but in no way represents the Muslim organization, uh, the Muslims in, in the country, which for us would be a, a key component of a Muslim Brotherhood linked organization or Muslim Brotherhood inspired organization. And this union does not achieve that. Um, if we move forward in time a little bit in the year in the early 2000s, uh, we start to see uh, that these organizations have actually been successful at obtaining a status of religious entities and uh, this has allowed them to conduct more um, activities after that, uh, meaning uh, they could, uh, it depends on, on the country, obviously, because uh, some countries have a different uh, registry, registries uh, for such organizations, but um, it has allowed them to be, uh, first of all, represented legally, and uh, second of all, uh, being percep 
perceived as a religious organization, not just a uh, non-governmental organization, an NGO, as they have been before. So here, here we have focused on, in the Czech Republic, we see the Islamic Foundation in Prague and its sister organization in Brno. Brno is the second largest city in Czech Republic. And uh, these two are tied uh, together through uh, an umbrella organization, uh, the Center of Muslim, uh, of Muslim, I would say Muslim, not religious, but of Muslim uh, diaspora. And um, these two organizations have had some activities, especially publication activity that we have seen that could possibly tie them to, uh, to be, to tell, to say that they are Muslim brother inspired. So for instance, the one in Prague have, uh, have uh, showed support for a public publication from the FIOE. Uh, it has, uh, it has also showed a video on, on, on their website of the, uh, care of the Council of American Islamic, uh, now, I, now I will not remember the last uh, letter, but uh, this is an organization that has been labeled by Lorenzo Vidino as, as a, a Muslim Brotherhood inspired and a representative in the United States. Um, and lastly, they also, they also, in their electronic library, they have a book that has been published by the World uh, Assembly of Muslim Youth, WAMI, uh, as well, so we have we see some publication activity that, based on literature, would would lead you to believe that uh, they are Muslim Brotherhood inspired. And um, however, these things, uh, these events, or this activity has been uh, contained to the two thousands, and uh, we don't see a lot of con we don't see a continuation into the present time in in this case. The Islamic Foundation in Brno is also quite interesting. Um, we have seen. It has been found out uh, by its for by their former uh, member uh, that they have actually written a letter to Yusuf Karadawi, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood ideologue currently in Qatar, who where they were trying to get in touch with to the Palestinians, and it was just said to the Palestinians uh, in that time. It was in two thousand and one to to transfer some funds that they had to the people of Palestine. Uh, when, they were con when the leader of this foundation in Brno was confronted with this fact, he, had, uh, he used very interesting rhetoric where he, uh, where he mentioned that uh, he sees Yusuf Karadavi as a wise person and, uh, and it is the Zionists that are trying to, um, trying to make him not be in touch with, with Karadavi. Uh, and this was in 2012. This was 11 years later when he was confronted about this. So uh, there was a, I would say, clear and public um, affiliation to, to Mr. Karadawi, uh, as well as they distribute a, a magazine called Al Islam, which comes from the, its Slovak branch. And this magazine was interesting to us for one specific reason. Uh, where it has been talking about political Islam um, on its in its featured article on the cover page, um, there has been a, an article written uh, in defense of political Islam and how how to understand this, especially in countries like Turkey and Tunisia, um, um, in the you know through the lenses of being a, a movement that has been uh, uh, persecuted. So that was the idea there. However, this magazine comes from the year 2004 if i'm not mistaken and again we it was the only magazine that uh was uh, at the mosque uh, to be found so we couldn't see any newer issues there weren't any and uh they sort of hints at possible financial issues that this uh, foundation might have or a change in uh, in publishing activity or at least at the publishing strategy and again also it was it was actually not even uh, in theirs it was from the slovak branch the last already mentioned Muslim Union is um, founded by, by Mr. Abbas, showed support for Muhammad Morsi, in, uh, the ex-president of Egypt uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood Party. Uh, as he, they showed support uh, on social media for, this, for, this, uh, for Mr. Morsi, and uh, as well as they used the Rabia symbol, a uh, symbol that has been used or attached to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt during the, uh, the 2011 uh, Egypt uh, or Arab Spring in Egypt, and 
uh, this was used uh, on the Facebook page of their uh, of their publication called the Muslim Letters. Again, another publication that has been discontinued, uh, inactive on social media and and other, it hasn't been distributed anywhere else. So we see that early two thousands were uh, a time of activity. Very similar happen uh, events happening in Poland. Muslim students associations that I already talked about have been. Uh, we have found that they've been inviting Islamist figures uh, of, for instance, the FIOE to Poland back in the early 2000s and published books by, by Said Kut, Kut uh, another ideologue of Muslim Brotherhood, uh, infamous ideologue in this case. Um, but this is an organization that has not been very active in the recent years. Uh, as far as I remember, the actual quote from an interviewee was, this is a muted organization. So one that still exists, but uh, is not very uh, active in publication. The much larger, much larger organization, Muslim League, um, has been known to be to pick it uh, Egyptian embassy after Morsi's ouster in 2013, which has led them to lose some support among its uh, founders, uh, sorry, not founders, but financial backers or donors. Um, unfortunately, because these, not unfortunately, they simply have, have lost a lo large amount of funding due to this uh, events because uh, the donors have been coming, uh, they come from the MENA countries, Middle East and North Africa countries that are in opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood movement as such. And obviously this has uh, led to, to, let's say a bad taste in their mouth. And last but not least, Islamic community in Serbia, that is the one that is tied to, um, that is representing mostly Bosnians in, in Serbia. Um, and this community, this community, the only, uh, I wouldn't say proof, but be, the only connection that we could find was a personal connection with, between the, uh, the Mufti Surkolic, Sukorlic, sorry, excuse me, and, and uh, the leader of the Bosnian Islamic organization, Cerić. However, because the, it was believed that Cerić has ties to Muslim Brotherhood, however, we have seen that we have also heard the opinions that Serich is a um, political chameleon uh, in inverted commas, meaning a person who is very well versed and uh, knows how to um, talk to each side diplomatically and sort of uh, not, I would say, a person who would not take any sides in a conflict or in, in, in any uh, ideology, uh, simply a pragmatic man, and this was uh, also this was also uh, confirmed to us by one of our advisors in the project. Then we move on to the 2015, and 2015 has been interesting for two reasons. Uh, on one hand, Europe was affected by the so-called refugee crisis, and on the other, it suffered major attacks by by Daesh or ISIS, um, and this has had a particularly strong effect on the region, on the, uh, on the Central and Eastern Europe. Because um, most of these, most of the countries that were, we were studying adapted, adopted legislature that came from the Western European neighbors, although this, these countries have not been affected by um, religiously inspired terrorism, uh, and by this I mean obviously jihadism, um, however, there have been new laws being passed on arrest and prosecution of, of people who were suspected of, of having links to terrorists. Um, and the media played a, uh, an important role, um, which has, they have sort of, uh, the media that we have found have been intertwining the, the two phenomena, the so-called refugee crisis and, and the terrorist uh, attacks that happened in Brussels and, and, and Paris, especially, um, which have put forth or which have set things in motion uh, in these in these three countries, uh, things such as uh, protests against refugees. Um, we have seen attacks on mosques, um, for instance, you know, graffiti uh, on sprayed on the walls or leaving mm, pigs' heads in front of the mosques. Uh, and uh, and such criminal acts 
Um, but at the same time, we have seen a, simply the secularization of, of Muslims and Islamophobia ensued after, after year, the year 2015. And uh, the situation has not been very um, comfortable for, for, this, for any Muslims in, in the countries, whether they're autochthonous or, or, uh, or expatriates or immigrants. Uh, but here I would like to make a distinction in the case of Serbia, where you see uh, the Islamophobia that, uh, that is directed to the autochthonous communities comes from a different place uh, and the feelings are mostly attached to the, to the inter-ethnic wars of, of Yugoslav wars in the 1990s. Um, although it is, uh, although the, the idea there is that uh, Muslims in those particular parts of Serbia, uh, uh, th those places are dangerous and there is statistically proven, uh, I would say very low affinity to uh, either Bosniaks or Albanians within Serbia. But on the other hand, the Islamophobia towards um, the immigrants comes, is, is attached to the feeling of the fear of the unknown. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, hoax articles uh, circulated in the media uh, that has also gave way or space for far-right views uh, and the immigrants have been tied to um, the, the narratives have been circulating all the way from uh, them trying to impose their way of life on Serbs all the way to uh, to presenting a health risk or being criminals or petty criminals so we have seen uh, we have seen a change of environment to which these studied communities had to react in some way. Now we're getting to the present day, um, where we can see a trend of looking inwards, and by that I mean the communities are starting to look at Muslim communities only. Uh, they are not trying to do any outreach activities. Uh, publications have been have been uh, have been curtailed. Uh, closing uh, or closing some of those magazines uh, like Hlas in, in Czech Republic or As Salam in Poland. Um, we see limited presence in the media. Some leaders have gone to schools trying to explain uh, Islam as faith and detach Islam from terrorism, jihadi terrorism especially. Um, but we don't see a lot of proactivity. Many websites are non-working for instance and one thing we have also noticed is the financial struggle uh, of these communities. Um, we see that, uh, as I mentioned, in the case of, of Poland, uh, the Muslim League has um, apparently lost its funding from the donors that it used to have. And it has also stretched itself financially greatly, right actually at, in 2015, because uh, the community has, or the organization has built a mosque right outside Warsaw. Um, uh, a, a big structure that uh, currently leaves them struggling financially according to the interviews that we have conducted. This however opens the floor to other actors and here we see uh, the United Arab Emirates in Saudi Arabia and Turkey uh, trying to um, especially financially support certain projects such as building of mosques and uh, and, uh, and Islamic centers uh, to various degree of success, I would say. Uh, in the Czech Republic, this has been hugely medialized and uh, none of this actually came through uh, because of the, I would say, the um, protests and uh, signing of, uh, of, um, um, of, uh, uh, sorry, just lost the word. But uh, generally, the population has has shown protest to to such activities, and uh, sort of it shows that the Islamophobia from the 2015 is still uh, very much present. Um, however, Turkey is uh, an, an interesting. Uh, I think this is this is something that we would like to focus on, especially in our next report that will be focused on Bosnia and Herzegovina and and North Macedonia because we've seen Turkey being much more active in Serbia already through the Islamic uh, community in Serbia so the one that is uh, that has uh, connections to the to, to Bosnia and Herzegovina so this is something we would like to uh, focus on 
So in conclusion, I would like to leave you with five general uh, brief points. Uh, we see that formal connections to the Muslim Brotherhood run organizations are currently inoperative. Uh, the second point is there is, we haven't seen any DAWA activity, no proselytization and uh, publication activities are currently very scarce. Relationships with governments in the Czech Republic and Poland are gloomy at the moment, uh, especially in Czech Republic. There was also a case of, of um, police intervention in one of the Islamic communities, uh, which has left a very bad taste in mouth of, of the community and has resulted in even less people or fewer people attending the, the Friday mosque because it happened exactly on a, a Friday prayer, sorry, because it, the intervention happened on Friday a few minutes before the prayer and uh, uh, there was a unsubstantiated or never really well explained uh, intervention from the Ministry of Interior uh, trying to seize a book that was supposed to be uh, tied to terrorist ideology or jihadist ideology but uh, even the Czech court actually in the end proved that it was not. So uh, in Serbia they are better uh, but mostly of ceremonial character. The fourth point is the aim to improve, the aim of these organizations is currently to improve the perception of Muslims and stabilize, stabilize their finances. Uh, in other words, I would say these organizations are now former shadows of themselves uh, and uh, trying to survive. And the last point is the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated individuals in the Czech Republic are out of energy. So we have found uh, a group of individuals that have been active in especially the 2011 um, and have, traveled to Egypt and joined the movement, but uh, this was a small group that has not been uh, active otherwise. It has not been formally uh, organized in any of the organizations that I have talked about and are now even fewer in numbers uh, since some have uh, decided to stay in, the Czech Rep in, in e Egypt and find, found or establish different organizations that are uh, not tied to the Muslim Brotherhood because they have been quite the uh, have been quite disappointed with uh, what the Muslim Brotherhood has achieved there. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't been too long. I uh, thank you very much, Victor. I really appreciate you. A, a very interesting presentation. Of course, a very interesting report. Um, we've, um, and thank you to everyone who's already typed uh, some questions in the Q and A. Um, there are a couple of very strategic ones on financing national organizations and, uh, um, and the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, a potential role in de-radicalization, um, which I would like with your understanding to move to the general discussion. Um, but there are a couple of specific questions um, on why these three countries um, and why the Muslim Brotherhood that I think is, is a good way to, to address this now because it does re relate primarily just to the research rather than the issue. On why the Muslim Brotherhood, I, I would like to, you know, basically take that question because this is a cooperation between CEP and Globsec and we decided to focus on the Muslim Brotherhood precisely because, as it says in the question, it is a, a less discussed subject. Uh, there's a broad literature on the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, in the Middle East and its history, and there's a broad literature also in Western Europe, but the, the CEE region um, has not really been the focus of a lot of research. So we saw a clear research gap here that with this project we're trying to fill. But um, there was again a question, why those three countries from all of the countries in the region that uh, uh, you're focusing now on, of course part of the answer is there will be more reports. Um, and, but there was also an, an argument that you addressed in the last webinar for the first report, why not Bulgaria? Because there is a specific situation in Bulgaria, why is that not part of the countries that you selected? Right, um, so the reason, ah, yeah, I'm still, yeah. Uh, the reason why we chose not to go for Bulgaria is, um, is rather a pragmatic one. It's not so much tied to ideology, but it's, uh, it's a pragmatic reason of, of, I would say too many communities intertwining and uh, the, I, the question of identity comes to mind immediately um, because we have communities that are, um, that are, Bulgarian, but uh, perceive themselves as uh, as Turkish ethnically uh, and linguistically, uh, and that means culturally uh, and also religiously, they take up Islam. Then we have Roma communities who are which are um, marginalized by the fact because they are Roma, um, 
and then if we're looking into the reasons for uh, converting to Islam or you know radicalizing in Islam if they have been Muslim previously uh, that uh, it, it it becomes an issue distinguishing between the two uh, the two phenomena going on at the same time and why uh, why these individuals would join such a group so we have multiple issues with identity and uh, and and religion coming to play which are just i would say are it would not be a very clear cut case to present uh i think it would be a good idea to map bulgaria but within the scope that we we have planned it would be a uh, an extra work that might not be you know might not result in in anything productive just yet especially if we have other cases that present a better case for us so fantastic that answers the question <laughs> thank you very much victor um since we are a little bit behind the schedule um, um i would say we will refer to all the the questions that are still already online um uh, for the general discussion and i would like now to move to the responding presentation of uh, Professor Mingeva. Uh, professor Mingeva is an Associate Professor of International Relations and Security Studies at the University of Sofia. She has earned her doctorate from the University of Maryland. Her areas of expertise include conflict, security, terrorism, and transport identity networks, with a regional focus on Southeast Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. She has worked on multiple international projects, including the Ter Crime Terror Alliance project funded through the National Consortium for the study of terrorism and response to terrorism at the University of Maryland, the Human Security Project funded through the European Commission's sixth framework program and coordinated by the University of Graz, the Prevention of Armed Conflicts Project funded through the NATO Science for Peace and Security program and coordinated by the University of Grenoble. She has published extensively on the areas of her expertise. Her most renowned uh, publication is her book titled Crime Terror Alliances and the State, Ethno-nationalist and Islamic challenges to regional security, co-authored with Ted Robert Gur. Um, she is also an independent international analyst at various media outlets and social networks. Professor Mincheva, the floor is yours. I'm looking forward to your presentation. You need to unmute yourself first. Marco, can't you unmute me? Fantastic. No, you, you muted yourself again. Just click on it once on the small microphone in the bottom left corner. There you go. Is it okay now? Yes, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schindler, respectable Mr. Rips and respectable Mr. Klus, respectable Dr. Schindler, and dear Mr. Skus and Globsec team, it is my, my pleasure to step up as discussant within a webinar session introducing the most recent research on issues related to political Islam in Southeast Europe, Central East Europe, conducted by an experienced team of Bratislava-based Globsec and supported with funds through the Counter-Extremism Project. This report is Globsec's second in rage. It undertakes a pioneering effort to map out activities of transborder identity networks, in particular the Muslim Brotherhood Network across Central East Europe. The project is an intellectual challenge, at least in two ways. Most of the recent academic and policy-oriented research dealing with political Islam have been focused on West Europe, the US, the Middle East, as well as North Africa and South Asia regions. Central East Europe, in contrast, has been left out of this research. Now that we integrate Central East Europe onto the agenda, we not only have to catch up with ongoing studies in the field, as this report suggests, issues of political Islam are nowadays yet neatly intertwined with issues of multiculturalism, ethnic tolerance, societal cohesion, extremism, far-right movements, terrorism, and securitization of Islam, at that within the controversial context of yet a five-year evolving EU refugee crisis, 
The Muslim Brotherhood activities in Central East Europe is a project that intersects in one way or another all of the above areas. It meets the challenge of this complex research topic with a respectable expertise. However, the vast spectrum of related questions awaits a comprehensive discussion. And you have the slide in front of you about the organization of this discussion. Transborder identity movements to which the Muslim Brotherhood belongs have been a matter of scrutinized research for more than 30 years now. In a famous book on social movement and contentious politics, Sinitaro suggests that power in movement may seem elusive vis-a-vis -vis institutional power. However, movement's impact on politics, society, and international relations should not be undermined. Social movements are unique actor of modern politics, which keep alive unwritten archives of contentious politics and bring them up to the policy for any time when cleavages in the established status quo invite abrupt social or political transformations. Ideology and cognitive mobilization are social movements mobilization mechanisms. Simultaneously, however, movements gather with additional strength as they aggregate, diffuse, and expand as much in areas as also in numbers. Political Islam has recently provided increasing number of examples in this respect. Islamic movements, whether moderate or radical, have acted self-assertively in the politics of Middle East, North Africa and South Asia. And as this report reveals, they have also gained a foothold on the East European soil. As suggested by the general social movement theory, the political excursion of the Muslim Brotherhood to as a walk on moving sands Acting depending on circumstances, the movement is in switch tactics, as Globsec report observes, from cooperation with regimes and cooperation with opponents to operating underground or adopting terrorism as tactics. Symptomatically, Al-Qaeda has once engaged in harsh polemics against the Brotherhood's moderate political philosophy. Al-Zarqawi referred to the Muslim Brotherhood as liars and hypocrites weakened faithful Muslims by downplaying the duty of jihad and frequently changing their religious perception in response to political circumstances. Al-Qaeda criticism toward the Brotherhood was correct on issues of tactics, however, it did not stand to issues of strategy. The Brotherhood's primary political objective formulated in terms of reviving Islamic social order in Egypt and ultimately creating a caliphate of Islamic states. The Brethren are the largest Islamic movement in the modern times and the first to originate in the Arab world. With its branches in various geographical location, locations and harsh political experience surviving hardships, the Muslim Brotherhood fully matches our perception of a powerful identity movement which gains strength as it surmounts recurring difficulties. Based on this analyst, Mayor Hatina has recently observed Al-Qaeda needs the Brethren more than they need it. This report studies the Muslim Brotherhood potential branches and activities in the Czech Republic, Poland, and Serbia. Issues of dissemination of revivalist ideas, conversion, and proletarianism are at its focus. However, these issues only constitute only the top of the iceberg. How do we assess the movement's overall performance in view of its long historical records? How would, would we assess the movement's performance in view of its organizational structure? Our assessment could be at the minimum ambiguous, at the maximum controversial. Let's look up some historical records. It is understood that Bosnia will be a case study for a next Globsec project. As introduction to this project, we could perhaps remind that the Muslim Brotherhood has been, have been active in the 1990s Bosnian Civil War. The SDA, the, pretty, the party of uh, democratic action established by Ali Izad Begovic, Bosnia's first president, incorporated structures such as the Young Muslims, which are known for their long-standing ideological ties to the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. The harsh U.S. approach to the Bosnian war at its final stages and after, as well as the Dayton peace accords, demanded all foreign fighters out of Bosnia. Under pressure from Washington, Izad Begovic, personally committed himself to a campaign aimed at sending the Mujahideen back home. The departure of the Muslim foreign fighters look at the surface as a completed and irreversible process. In actuality, however, the post-Dayton Bosnia was undergoing intense transformations as the result of the lasting interaction between international Islam and the Bosnian Muslim community. At the beginning of the 21st century, Islamist movement gained a different reputation. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Research team observed in 2006 that nowadays in the Arab world, 
Islamists have uh, assumed the role once played by national liberation movements and leftist parties. As mass movements of the 21st century, they are well embedded in the social fabric, understand the importance of good organization, and are thus able to mobilize considerable constituencies. Their ideology prescribes a simple solution to the present Arab society crisis. Islam is the solution, has been the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood long-term slogan. Mainstream Islamist movement, the so-called moderate movements, have renounced violence and chosen to advance their goals through political means. In some countries, they embrace non-violence and democracy. Yes, this is only a recent development, and yes, fear persists that these movements could revert to their radical nature. However, the big achievement is that democracy and human rights somehow found their way into the rhetoric and political strategies of mainstream Islamist organizations. Mm -hmm. Political participation, especially in elections, became a priority for some of them. Assessments of Islamist movement present to us yet another challenge. The Islamist opposition movement in the Arab states, as well as elsewhere, only constitute one category of nonviolent Islamic organizations. The other categories comprise what can be called the Islamic establishment. This is a complex of Islamic organizations, clerics and institutions close to the government. Islamic establishment exists in most Arab countries. They are particularly important in, in Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Islamic establishment have almost found a web of structures, religious institutions and funding agencies in post-war Bosnia. Globsec report also documents that a number of clerics and institutions some with close connections to the government expand the Islamic establishment's networks in Europe as well. The number of most prominent organizations in West Europe amounts to nine. The same number has been reported for all institutions acting across the Central East Europe selected by the Globsec uh, report case studies. Overall, we come to acknowledge that the concept of the Islamist movement presents us with a conceptual stretching challenge. It expands to include a broader subject, which is the Islamic establishment setting in action objective pursued by political Islam. On the other hand, political and international dynamics reshape national and regional contexts where the Islamic movements operate. Since the beginning of the century, the European Union is very active in its EU-Africa dialogue. EU has developed policies encouraging security, prosperity and development in Africa. Member states have been increasingly receptive toward mi migrants from Africa and North Africa in particular. Muslim communities in Europe created <coughs> increasing numbers and populations. Alongside, they gradually develop its own structures, assisting their everyday needs. The developing multicultural setting in Europe provided favorable circumstances to Islamic movements to gain a footprint in Europe. The expanding Islamic establishment move a step further to undertake activities of social and political significance. Nowadays, discussions on Islamic movement activities in Europe have a richer agenda, including cultural, social, political issues, as well as issues of societal cohesion. Lorenzo Vidino observes brotherhood could serve as integrating force for local Muslims. However, the opposite is as much possible. The movement can turn into subversive force, Islamizing the Muslim community and separating it from larger Western community. Globsec report provides supporting detail. Having established loosely cooperating national branches, the brotherhood later formed supranational structures in an effort to influence the European Union. Overall, we come to acknowledge that determining topic in this and future debates will be the issue of political Islam performing activities on the European soil, ranging across the entire cultural and political spectrum and utilizing resources from various institutions of the Islamic establishment anywhere in Europe. A final contextual detail is in order here. The 15-16 rise in terrorist attacks across Europe Perpetrated in parallel with the European refugee crisis marks a turning point in the evolution of the Islamic networks. Terrorism in the 21st century is most serious threat. Global terrorism database presents charts of terrorist extremist in incidents from 1 through 18 worldwide, as well as by regions of the West and East European as follows. This is the general slide that you see. Could you please uh, move to the next slide? So. Uh, yes, here the chart present world incidents uh, altogether 119.804. Then next slide presents uh, 
world incidence in pie chart and we could see that Eastern Europe and West Europe are, are only uh, present a, a relatively small share of the global violence. And the next two charts present individually the rise and decline of violence in uh, West Europe. First chart and in East Europe, second chart. The graph suggests, let's uh, summarize, in comparison to other regions, West and East European incidents separately as well as jointly only constitute small share in the overall volume of global violence. All graphs, secondly, expose unsurprising trend terrorism and violence increased between 11 and 15, reflecting the rise of the Islamic State in the Middle East and the expanding Syrian war. European researchers summarize and publish relevant information. European terrorism is as much imported from the Middle East as it is also a homegrown phenomenon. It has evolved in multiple stages over more than three decades. Europe has witnessed a process whereby transborder Islamist networks have initially sought to establish terrorist cells across Europe. As the process gather momentum, individuals born and raised in Europe set to establish Islamist cells locally. Their resource has been later used to re-export violence back to the Middle East as the Syrian conflict regionalized. Two terrorism-related issues await mentioning in PASIC, securitization of Islam and the Speech Act. Securitization of Islam owes its sources to a series of Muslim-associated terrorist attacks in the Western world. Islam has been securitized in politics, academia, and media, which portrayed it as an existential threat to the Western democracies and Western civilization in general, and also to international security. In response to terrorism, these countries developed new security policies and adopt counterterrorism measures. Analysts note that uh, while securitization discourses are fully justified with reference to actors such as Al Qaeda and Daesh, they shall not be applied indiscriminately to Islam or Muslims in general. Securitization discourse applied also to migrants and refugees. We as citizens of the European Union know well the assumptions underlying the securitizing discourse of immigration. They include a assumption of existing link between immigration and terrorism, b the assumption that immigrants arguably drain a nation, nation's resources and c assumptions that immigration potentially threatens a society's cultural achievement. The above discussed issues unveil some aspects in the academic and political context of the Islamic networks in Europe. While formally not a part of the current GlobeSec project, the West European context matter for purposes of this discussion. The GlobeSec report has set the task to identify organs, organizations in the Czech Republic, Poland and Serbia with membership in Muslim Brotherhood European bodies. GlobSec report introduces three types of organizations, namely the Brotherhood affiliated organizations, Brotherhood inspired and gray zone groups. The report provides details about various Islamic foundations, unions, Muslim students, religious associations and communities, including their establishment and activities. Hereafter, we discuss some comments, uh, we suggest some comments on the GlobSec report because of the time constraints, just a few would be introduced below uh, uh, and we also suggested the end two general discussion questions comments political organizations make sense within the context of the social group they represent globsec report has identified different muslim communities across the three selected countries methodologically the group cluster in three categories they are either a, a, a doctomus group expatriates or converts we would recommend that report perhaps pay a little bit more attention in the next addition uh, to minority groups and their situation. While it is the institutions that are here in focus, we would assume that a more committed study of communal identity groups could perhaps provide additional strengths in tracking formal and informal connection between local organizations and the Muslim Brotherhood groups. Else, with insufficient information about the group's grievances and this, uh, this uh, about group grievances and uh, the organization's activities could simply be viewed as a matter of personal ambitions of its leadership or as ad hoc made statements on behalf of individual leaders. This particularly concerns the analysis of organizations operating in the Czech Republic. In comparison, the Polish analysis is convincing. Here we see the Muslim League acting out of pragmatic considerations to secure funds to the marginal Muslim community in Poland. 
the Polish Muslim Union is involved in the dissemination of revivalist literature. Next, GlobSec report is time sensitive. The report paid particular attention to the path breaking events of 15 and 16. It introduces state policies and public reactions in the Czech Republic and Poland toward the refugee flows to Europe. The reactions on behalf of the European Commission have been rightly presented. Also, the diverse reactions on behalf of the civil society, including also migrant protectionist activities, have received the due attention. The intercommunal tension ensuing from prevailing state and public reactions have been discussed in a fair manner. The Serbia discussion, uh, discussion on Islamophobia within the evolving 15 16 events is convincing. I would, however, advance an alternative opinion. You do not have to agree with it. Based on our knowledge of inter ethnic tensions, which Serbia inherited from collapsing Yugoslavia, I would tend to question the relevance of the term Islamophobia in local context. Is it Islamophobia that we witness in Serbia, or are the current public reactions not an echo of the 1990s savage interethnic Yugoslav wars? We know that ethno territorial national cause is strong and resistance to ideologies that water down its agenda. An example provides the Kosovo Albanians. They received money from the Middle East, yet uncompromising on their strategic ethno territorial political objectives. In its concluding section, GlobSec reveals intriguing details concerning the most recent activities of Islamist group in uh, Central East Europe. The report pays particular attention to the Salafist and Wahhabi groups in Serbia. The group of Takfiris incorporating Salafi and Wahhabis and counting about 100 members has been singled out as a violent group, threatening other members of Muslim communities. The evolution of this group is indicative of trends developing within the political Islam. It is not impossible that political Islam experience further internal fractionalizations and polarization among different groups and organizations. Last but not least, the report highlights the role that regional player Turkey attempts to attain. As this report knows, Turkey sees to expel com competing Islamist donors from the Balkans, such as uh, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, which served as traditional sponsors of Muslim political structures. Counting on her historical ties to the region, Turkey is again to become an alpha and omega in the Balkans. To recapitulate, the presented Globe Sec report is a respectable analysis contributing to studies of transborder identity movement, political Islam in Europe, and it is situated within unprecedented political and international dynamical context. The research team deserves acknowledgement. The research task is accomplished with the dedication. Hopefully the messages conveyed in this report will reach social and political institutions which would assist improvement of the situation with minority rights, radicalization, security, ethnic tolerance, and societal cohesion. Thank you. I have two discussion questions and I would uh, ask uh, the Yes, that we move forward to the next slide, where the discussion questions are actually formulated. The first is how uh, GlobSec uh, team, and particularly as its representative, Mr. Sus here, would uh, assess the strength of identified organizations as related to the Muslim Brotherhood or any of its revivalist printer branches in Europe, in view of Lorenzo Vigino's observation, which is uh, Copy paste here, there is no formal Muslim Brotherhood organization in any European country. It is technically incorrect to speak of organizations such as the Union of Islamic Organizations in France, Islamic Society of Germany, or the Muslim Association of Britain as Muslim Brotherhood organizations. Yet, taking a non-formalistic approach, it is fair to say that it's virtually all European countries. There, uh, there operate organizations and networks with historical, financial, personal, organizational, and ideological ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic revivalist movements worldwide. While most Brotherhood-related organizations are united under a pan-European umbrella organization, the Brussels-based Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe each operates independently in constant context with parallel organizations in other European countries and individuals but completely free to choose tactics and aims according to the circumstances of the country in which it operates. Based on this uh, uh, quote, uh, citation, and uh, sure in view of the major findings of the global uh, global uh, uh, report, um, we'll perhaps await some comments. Uh, 
Yes. How would you assess the strength? And second question, if you would allow me, it's also based. Next Should we slide. take those questions in turn to give Victor actually, um, because it's, it's a lot of, uh, of text there. Um, let's give uh, Victor an opportunity to, to respond to the first question and then we move on okay. to the second question. Okay. Thank you. Victor. Thank you so much, Hans. Um, uh, Mark, I'll be can brief you go back I... one slide so that we have it on the screen? Yes, that would be very useful. Thank you. I'll try to be brief because I also took a lot longer than I, I expected in my presentation. So I want to give uh, room for other questions from the audience. So um, in or, in, to, to answer your question, Professor Minchera, um, we, I wouldn't like the, I think the most important thing how we assess the strength of uh, Muslim Brotherhood organizations is I think their ability to represent a community towards the government and therefore uh, obtain let's say better position for the Muslims in within the country uh, whether that's you know like I mentioned before building religious schools or being part of the army uh, even being able to marry people for instance, in Czech Republic, this doesn't exist. Uh, I don't believe that's the case in Poland either. So, uh, and so none of these organizations can uh, have this uh, this right. Uh, maybe I'm wrong actually about the Poland. Uh, probably the Tatar, Tatar community could could be uh, could have some of these rights. But I also want to be clear that um, our report also says that we haven't really found any organizations that are linked to the Muslim Brotherhood in these three countries. Uh, we have looked at these particular communities or organizations, but uh, there has been a lot of uh, conflicting evidence uh, for us to determine that, yes, indeed, they are uh, Muslim Brotherhood linked. So we all actually labeled them in the third group as uh, gray area groups, because um, not only the evidence we found was contradictory, but also um, the interviews that we have conducted, which was the the spine of our research of the methodology, uh, none of our interviews would confirm that uh, yes, indeed, there is Muslim Brotherhood in this country. Uh, most of these activities have been interpreted as pragmatic reasons. And as I already mentioned, the financial uh, uh, struggle that they are experiencing is just so great that they, they go to whichever uh, uh, donor they can go to. So, um, and and in view of uh, Lawrence Abedino's uh, uh, observation, uh, we haven't found really any links to other uh, other organizations outside abroad or no cooperation, no informal network of, of people uh, that would be still active. This was the, maybe the thing of the 90s, but uh, not really current anymore. Fantastic. Should we move on to the second question and then brief answer, brief question, please, because um, we have uh, a couple of questions from the audience that I want to get to before the time's up. Right. Yeah, the second question, uh, how would you assess activities of the ambassadorial council of the Muslim countries in Poland? Do they match our perception of admissible political and diplomatic behavior or are they questionable? and deviant from the established diplomatic protocol. Here, again, the question is based on a quote by Lorenzo Vidino and also some of your uh, findings in the report concerning the funding of the uh, Muslim minority in Paul. Mm -hmm. Embassy Islam I mean. is the big question. Uh, shall we go through the quote, maybe? Uh, uh, the quote is on the screen. Uh, yes, yes, okay. In the yeah. sake of time. <laughs> I'll try sure. to answer the question sure. the best I can. Uh, so um, I haven't mentioned the name, but this is the body that I referred to in the presentation. The Ambassadorial Council of the Muslim Countries in Poland is the body that uh, joins or, or gathers top diplomats from the MENA region, uh, uh, who would be the link uh, to Poland. Uh, and this is a body that actually have been funding some of the activities of the Tatar community back in the early 1990s, which uh, according to our interviews have been a actually welcomed uh, uh, activity from the state uh, because it was one less issue to be worrying about while transitioning from communist regime to democracy. Um, so there wasn't any, I would say, nefarious uh, activities there and later on it has moved or shifted, shifted its focus on on the Muslim League, uh, the body in Poland that represents the expatriates and converts in Poland and um, the moment they started uh, protesting in front of the Egyptian embassy after Mr. President Morsi's ouster, uh, Muslim League has lost its founding. Uh, so 
I don't see this as uh, any questionable uh, behavior at this moment uh, mm -hmm. since they, they, what we see is that they act out of pragmatic reasons as well. Fantastic. Well, thanks uh, for this uh, wonderful reply, uh, Professor Mincheva. I very much in detail also uh, um, in, uh, going through the report and highlighting um, the various sections. I, I really appreciate this.